It has high count rates and it can probe really big length scales, so sort of 50 nanometers up to the micron length scale. So it's basically like dynamic light scattering length scales, but with neutron contrast. There are obviously disadvantages to this, otherwise we do it all the time. And those disadvantages are that the signal is superimposed on that direct beam that we're hiding on the SANS detector. So actually your sample has to scatter quite strongly to be able to distinguish it away from the direct beam. We have to have an analyzer in place to do these measurements, and that obviously impacts on the angular coverage we can have on the detectors. And at the minute, SANS and CSANS cannot be run at the same time. So you have to do either one or the other. And people often want to measure the SANS and the spin echo SANS of their sample. So it can be a very long measurement time if you need to do both. The encoding currently is only in one direction. So I was telling you before about the, the, the coolness about having a 2D image. It allows you to see if there's anything uh, isotropic. So at the minute, we can only look at um, samples that are anisotropic or, or uniform in all directions. But the, the technique is available and it's used very heavily by the Colorado community. So things that have food science is very popular because they have a lot of things on this sort of large and length scale. Polymer guys, bio guys, they're all very interested in it. But it, it's still a, a new technique for us, I would say. So just to sort of give it an overview of what the size is and what we can look at. So obviously you have your crystallography on one end, which is classical diffraction. The microstructure is in the middle, which is where sand sits. We tend to look at proteins, micelles, polymers, porous material, precipitates, et cetera. So sort of a few nanometers to hundreds of nanometers. And then sea sands really kicks in where we can start to look at yeah, viruses, some grain structures, that kind of thing. But that, that's the kind of overlap between the classical diffraction sands and spin echo sands. So we cover quite a broad range of ISIS. Um, and typically we look at bulk properties, so structure, size, polydispersity, uh, particle interaction, that kind of thing. So, as I say, SANS is pretty intense. We do a lot of different science. It's a, if you love science, it's a great place to work. If you hate science, it's rubbish. Uh, every day is totally different. I can be doing, you know, protein mixtures one day and then skirmions the next. It, it is a really exciting place to be uh, if you like doing lots of crazy experiments. Uh, anything you could think of, we've probably tried it at least once with the sands being live. So just to give you an idea of not only the science, but the sample environment that we have available, we have a really broad range of stuff that you can do to your sample. So we can obviously look at things like magnetic nanoparticles, so using very large magnets, anything from a few, you know, half a tesla, probably even smaller, whatever the, the, that is, up to like, I think the biggest we've ever had is 14 tesla. So we have quite a range of magnetic fields. We obviously have sample changes for kind of standard solution scattering. We can do grazing incidence measurements where we reflect off the surface, to sort of do sands from a surface. We can do rheology, so looking at systems under shear, we can do that on the beam line. We have link cam, so if you want to cool your sample down and look at things like cryoprotectants, we can do that. Foam cells, if your sample is unstable, we can rock and rotate it to try and keep those large particles in the sample while we're doing the measurement. We can do kinetics, so we have looked at exchanging nano emulsions with stop flow. We can T-jump, so if you're interested in looking at complex polymer mixtures, we can T-jump it to look at those non-static uh, those non-static structures. Um, we've got a NERF setup, which basically allows us to do UV um, and fluorescence at the same time as the sands. Humidity chambers, if you want to heat your stuff up, we can put furnaces in. Um, we have CO2 pressure cells, 3D magnets, you name it, we probably try and do it. So it's an incredibly exciting place to be um, and just talk to us if there's anything that sort of you think, oh, yeah, quite fancy doing something or this would really apply to my area of science. Uh, we're happy to discuss it with you. So now I'm going to get onto some specific examples of not into a huge amount of detail because I kind of wanted to get a number into at least you get a flavour for the kind of information you can get out of uh, small angle scattering. So surfactants for CO2 is something that we've been doing at ISIS for a long time. Uh, it was initially kicked off by uh, the guys at the University of Bristol and UEA, so Julian Easton and Dave Staitler, uh, looking at basically a yeah, surfactant assembly in supercritical CO2. So that's just a picture of some of the work we've done there. So why do we want to do it? So the idea behind this is that you can take CO2 from the atmosphere and compress it down into a supercritical fluid and use that as a solvent or uh, of interest for doing chemical processes in. So often in a chemical synthesis, you use volatile organic chemicals. And when you finish with it, you burn it off. And clearly that's not green or environmentally friendly. So here the idea is you take the CO2 from the atmosphere, compress it down. So it's seen as green and clean. Uh, CO2 has a really accessible supercritical point. 73 bar, 31 degrees C. It's really easy to achieve. I mean, we all have a little pressure that does it quite simply. It's obviously non-flammable. There's plenty of CO2 about. It's recyclable. 
So the idea is you do your measurement under supercritical conditions, you let the pressure off, the, the product falls out, and then you can reuse the CO2 afterwards. Uh, it's cheap, non-toxic. Um, but the big problem is, oh, and you can use it for things like enhanced oil recovery. The bad thing about CO2 is actually a really crap solvent. It's actually not very good at being a solvent. So the idea was that you would try and encapsulate, and that's particularly for polar solutes. So the idea here was that you would encapsulate water nanopores within the CO2, and then that would sort of increase um, the, the, the number of solutes you could dissolve in CO2, it improve its sort of um, solvent properties. So that's the idea. So as you can imagine, the typical surfactants that you use in the lab don't work in CO2. So the group has spent a lot of time sort of designing bespoke uh, molecules that will sort of self-assemble into these structures and then not only self-assemble, but then allow you to encapsulate water uh, in the core of them. It's absolutely hammering it down here at the minute, so I can just hear the rain coming down. So um, how do we do that? Well, as I said before, we have a, a bespoke pressure cell. Uh, we pressurize the CO2. We have a special injection system that allows us to pump in um, water and a surfactant. And what we do here is we use heavy water. We use D2O. There's a very clear scattering. Um, there's a very clear signal from the D2O that we can see from the CO2. So it allows us to see if these nanopools of water is actually forming or not. So that's the kind of the image. That's what we have before. Then we add the surfactant, you get these nice nanodrops. And what that looks like from a scattering perspective on the raw detector measures, you get basically nothing. And then when you add the surfactant, you get some clear scattering around the beam stop. What we then do is then we can do the radial averaging. And the first paper to come from San Sudi was actually on some of these systems where we had designed a special tri-chain surfactant. It had three tails. And this was not only working in CO2, as shown here, it also works in uh, water and in oil. So we basically designed a super designer surfactant that works in any of the conditions that we're interested in. And the image there is of me a long time ago, because it's the first Santa the experiment, and that's the sort of the special pressure cell that we use. So that pressure cell is actually, as you can imagine, solid steel, but the windows are sapphire. So they're C-axis cut sapphire, and they're very chunky because they can go up to sort of a couple of kilobar. But they're actually totally transparent to neutrons because we pick sapphire. So again, it shows you you can design these really complex pieces of sampling environments. But if you think about the neutron properties, as long as you design the windows out of the right material, the sampling environment becomes transparent and you're only scattering from the from the sample that you're interested in. It's, it's really powerful. And then 36 more papers have followed. So we've done all sorts of tricks where we've changed the surfactant, we've changed the counter ions. It allows us to change the shape of those uh, micelles from sort of in the spherical ones that you saw to more elongated ones. That allows us to do things like playing tricks with the viscosity of the CO2, which can be handy when you're trying to enhance oil recovery or for storage. If you want to store the CO2, it needs to be thicker. We've done things where we form the melatype structures in it. So a whole range of different tricks we can now play. And that's all been, although we can see that the viscosity is changing, that, that the understanding that why it's happened is given by the neutrons. We can see the fact that these particles are elongating as we do stuff. So it's a really nice way of seeing what's going on in the sample. So another example I wanted to talk about was these low molecular weight um, gels or organogels. Uh, it's kind of a growing area of interest. And again, this has been work that's been supported by various universities, as you can see there. And generally, they are a molecularly a designed uh, molecule that we then has a 3D structure. It self-assembles and it forms a gel. Uh, and we can use scattering alongside things like microscopy to really understand the structures and how they change in situ with different triggering conditions. So why are people interested in these? Well, they can be used for things like um, drug release. Uh, so you can have a, a liquid and then a gel or a gel and a liquid. So they're normally triggered. They can be light carriers. They're used for cleanup spills on, on, the, on the sea, for example. So oil spills. They're used a lot in the pharmaceutical and cosmetics industries. Uh, for scaffolding, they have a many a large uh, variety of applications in the industry uh, that they're used for. So how do they work? You normally take a, a solution of those molecules, uh, as I showed you earlier. There's a trigger, so that can be light-induced, temperature, pH, or even solvent switching. That then forms this self-assembling of non-covalent fibres, and then eventually they form uh, entangled fibrous networks, and you uh, have a supporting uh, gel. So the example I show you there is just where it was a light triggering one. We basically had the sample. We made a little mask for it with the word gel on it. We shone a light on it and you can see clearly where the gel mask was. Some of it has gelled and some of it hasn't. Uh, and that's the scattering profile that you see uh, before and after gelling. So the, the white dots are just the normal um, 
the molecules on their own and then when we gel them they form, form this network and we can even see the node separation which is that little bump that you see in the data so we get quite a lot of information on the before and afters of these samples so here's some results from a recent paper from the guys up at Glasgow this is Dave Adams so here they were playing tricks with this molecule called 2-NAP-FF uh, and it has different stereo forms so you've got LLDD and then LDDL and they're shown there on the bottom right and just changing that stereochemistry totally changes the scattering and well, the structures that are formed by those different uh, gels. And you look at it as a, as a gel and you some were soft, some were hard, and they couldn't quite work out what was happening there. So we did some microscopy and you can kind of see that all the fibers are formed, but it was really difficult to tell <clears throat> if they were truly different. And then when we did the scattering, you can clearly see that the, the, the gels, the, the fibers formed are very different from each other. So if you have the DD and the LL, you form these more worm-like sort of wrapping around each of the hollow tubes. If you have a mix, you get this polydispersity that's added in. DL and LDL, sorry, LD and DL also give you sort of long, thin wall tubes. They tangle around each other less. And if you have a racemate, you basically get a mixture of structures, as, as you can imagine. So again, from the scaffolding, you get a very detailed picture of why these different types of gel are forming. And it helps people design better or tailored gels for the future. Excuse me. Just wanted to quickly talk about something called structural color. So this is something that happens quite a lot um, on the on the spin echo instrument because it's a larger length scale problem. Let's have a drink of water. So here we're really interested in the micron length scale. And this here, I can't remember the name of this little white beetle, but basically he's one of the whitest beetles ever. So he's very, very white. And people are, such as Axe and Nobel, are interested in how this creature manages to become so white. And the reason that they're interested in him <clears throat> is because of things like paint. So at the minute, with paint, you will use things like titanium dioxide. Um, and clearly, that's not great to have lots of nanoparticles kicking about. The way that you make titanium dioxide is not very nice. It kicks off a lot of CO2, I believe. And just having a lot of nanoparticles around is not great for the environment. So rather than trying to induce colour chemically, can we not induce colour structurally, which is what Mr. Beetle does? He does all his whiteness just by structure, not by chemistry. So if you can understand the structure of the beetle's shell, then hopefully you can make white paint that's based on structure rather than chemistry. So that's what the scientists at the University of Sheffield have been doing. They've been taking, I mean, these poor little beetles, they take, I'm sure they died of natural causes, but they take the, the, the bits of the outer bits of the beetle off and that's a, one of the little um, bits here on the right hand side. That's a, a, a beetle platelet on a, on a tip going into an X-ray beam line. So they've done a combination of the spin echo sounds, USACs, which is basically ultra small angle X-ray scattering, uh, reflectivity. They've done obviously uh, electron microscopy, SEM and TEM, as well as X-ray tom tomography, which is what that little thing they're going to spin around and have a look at it, which has then gained them a lot of structural information. So they've then been able to work out what molecules they need to make such a structure. <clears throat> and then hopefully that will lead to the design of new paints. And so what they've managed to do is that they've worked out from combining all these different measurements that these structures, <clears throat> first of all, they were able to work out what the structures are. So it's these spinodal type structures. And then actually how they were formed was by liquid-liquid separation. So they tracked that with the spin echo sounds. And so now they've been able to make a synthetic porous white solos acetate film which looks like Mr Bug's uh, shell and so they can now hopefully make white structural colour paint so it's been a really a multi-technique way of looking at quite a complex problem and then actually developing something that could be used in the future so accident but we're really pleased so that was really good um what time is it did you want me to wrap up soon or sorry I think we do have still time it's 12 okay. 40. So a few more examples then. So um, this is looking at over-based sulfonate engine oil additives. So we do a lot of work with the petrochemical industry trying to work out how to make their petrol less horrible, <laughs> shall we say. So this is looking at over-based um, engine oil. And this is working with uh, Cambridge University, but also Infinium and both Infinium and Lubrizol, uh, not together, of course, separately, but they're both interested in these, these additives. So these OBSAs are basically calcium carbonate nanoparticles stabilized by surfactant, um, and they are required to help with lubrication of the engine to avoid knocking or this kind of thing. 
uh, and their stability is crucial for their correct performance. If they, if the surfactants come away and they collapse the bottom of the, of the engine, they're no use to anybody. They know that they're affected by water at some level. And of course, the combustion process produces a lot of water. So what they're interested in is how does the combustion process affect the stability of these nanoparticles? So how do we do that? So they had an idea of what these particles look like. Um, so they're basically an amorphous calcium carbonate nanoparticle, which is about 10 nanometers. And they thought it was surrounded by this monolayer of surfactant, which stabilizes it. <clears throat> but what they didn't know is when you have water, where does the water go and how does it actually destabilize the particles? So there were three possible locations. One was that they form marginal micromotions. Uh, one is that it's just somehow dispersed throughout the calcium carbonate particles. And the other one was that it could be on the surface of the particles. So we designed this experiment with different contrasts. So we did H surfactants with D oil, sometimes all H, and then, and then a mixture of the two. And then we added D2O to some of them to, to work out exactly where the water goes. So that would be the I idealized picture. So that's where you can see everything. That's where you can just see the core. And if the water was to go on the outside, that's what it would look like. So then when we actually did the measurements, the water does go on the outside of the particle. So these are the SANS measurements. Um, we did lots of different contrasts, lots of different analysis. And basically, we found out that the calcium particles were actually smaller than they thought. They're only about six nanometers. But there is this sort of surfactant stabilizing shell around the outside. And then when we added the water, the water does indeed form this very thin layer in between the particle itself and the surfactants. And the more water you add, the bigger that layer gets, the particles break down. That's why they were becoming unstable. So that was a really insightful piece of work. Um, I can also talk about ionic liquids. But I guess you've seen quite a lot of chemistry already. So maybe if I flip to the last example, I think, which was about alloys. So just to give you a flavour that we can do something other than soft matter. So we work quite closely with Rolls-Royce and the University of Cambridge and, and other, other engineering companies, of course, looking at alloys. Uh, and this was an example of a nickel based uh, super alloy that's used in aero engine turbine discs. So why do people care about these things? And um, so the processes, so they have a lot of heat uh, cycle to these um, uh, turbine wing, uh, turbine blades to actually make, make them. And they were interested, the, the nickel alloys themselves, they have these exceptional mechanical properties. Uh, they're super corrosion resistant, which is great because you don't want your engine or your airplane wing falling off while you're flying in the sky. And they also work at really high temperatures. But what they want to be able to do is as they're doing these heat cycles to them, they want to be able to study how the structure of that alloy changes, but in situ. So they have lots of computer models that they have that they, they think why the, the different alloys break down at certain points, but they want to be able to validate that. And that's why they come and do neutron experiments. They don't bring every, every alloy ever. They bring a selection of them to, to test or validate the computer models that they have at the lab. So the results, so we could clearly see that these nickel alloys were composed of these different um, precipitates, which is really great. Uh, we did uh, lots of in-situ heating of the samples using a furnace to mimic these heat treatments that they do in the, in the manufacturing process. And then uh, they also did electron microscopy. We like to do uh, different measurements to really get a full picture of what's going on. And the SANS validated the computer models that they had been using. So it gave them really uh, improved understanding of what these different, uh, of these important alloys and, and how to develop them further. So just a quick thing about what is next. Uh, in the SANS group here at ISIS, people always want to get more out of their data. So we're kind of moving into this more atomistic and coarse grain modeling. It's, it's quite new for SANS uh, here at ISIS at least, but it's something that we're trying to do more of. We're, we're developing more programs to help users get more information out of their scattering profiles. Um, we're looking at things like real-time reduction to try and speed things up. The measurements themselves are quite quick, but often what can happen is the data reduction analysis can take quite a lot of time. So we're trying to improve that pipeline, I guess, that goes from measurement to producing a paper or an improvement or whatever it is that somebody's interested in. People want to look at a broader range of sizes. So we're looking at trying to get wider angles on SANS 2D to go to the smaller length, uh, smaller length scales. We're looking at focusing optics on Zoom to get to the bigger ones. We're even proposing a new beamline, a USANS beamline that would also allow us to get to, to larger length scales. People always want more crazy sample environments. So we're working with the community um, to get uh, new uh, rheometers and, and all sorts of things that people want to do, flow cells, kinetics. People want to look at drying, levitation. It's all starting to come in now. So that, that end is being pushed a lot. In situ measurements are really becoming a thing. So people like to do light scattering or UV vis at the same time as they're doing their SANS measurements. So they can actually have a, 
a measurement that matches something they have in their lab. So they know the sample that they're measuring is exactly the same as the one they've measured in their lab. Uh, and in terms of sample design, people wanted to do more multi-component systems. So due to ratios having to sort of have to be thought about a little bit more because that's getting more complicated. People want more realistic samples. So you know, really multi-component things where you not have to do everything so sort of broken down. People want to make things that are smaller. Biology, for example, often don't have liters of the, of, the, of the sample. So we're trying to always go smaller and faster. So that's kind of where we are going, I think. Uh, and then all I wanted to say was um, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions. Thanks, Sarah, for a very nice presentation. Okay. So it was, yeah, it was covering wide range of applications in science, uh, biology, chemistry. Very interesting. So while we are waiting for, yeah, for questions, I have already one. <laughs> okay. Um, so I was wondering the application of um, neutron scattering for uh, cluster analysis in tin films for, let's say, semiconductor applications. So the dimensions, limitations that you can, um, the neutron can, can cope with this problem. So you're interested in nanoparticles at a surface? Uh, the cluster size of, let's say, uh, atomic scale clusters. So within very thin films, let's say 20, 30 nanometer. So do you see any application here? So for determining the cluster size and probably the, their distribution? Yeah, so um, thin film samples are not, well, there's two ways of doing it. If you're interested in cluster size, and that's still a small angle experiment rather than a reflectivity one. So depending on what a thin film is, we can do it two ways. We can either stack several films together, which can help make the sample thicker, so to speak, assuming that it's uniform throughout the sample. Or we can do that trick I was saying about with the lying down of the sample and doing engrazing instance geometry. So the at the minute, that's quite, for, for ISIS, it's a fairly new technique. Um, and it's something where you can get um, cluster size out of, as long as the clusters are kind of on the few nanometers to maybe 50 nanometers. We have looked up to 100 nanometers in size. Um, the difficult part of that is the analysis side of it. So if the samples aren't, if they're very, very disordered, it can be very difficult for us to see any sort of um, any information at those peaks. It's quite difficult to probe it. But if this, so we had some guys that had these very well ordered nanoparticles that surface that clustered. So then we were clearly able to see like the 50 nanometer ripple from, from the sample. So it depends, yeah, the thinness of the sample isn't necessarily an issue, it's the ordering within that surface and the size of the clusters that you're interested in. So I would say yeah, anything from a couple to maybe 100 nanometers in size. Okay, okay, thanks. And the contrast, of course, but we can just, yeah, we could always discuss the contrast. Yeah, yeah, I understand, yeah. It's really raining. So uh, in case of any question, you can write in question and answer. And I suppose it can be also after the presentation, if uh, Sarah is agree, yeah. agree with it, so they can send it out. Sure. Did you want me to stop sharing or?